Do you, Alex, take this woman to be your lawfully wedded wife, to live together in matrimony, to love her, comfort her, honor and keep her in sorrow and in joy, to have and to hold her from this day forward till completing the final ascension level doth part ye? I accept. You may not want to acknowledge it, but this is what happens every time you install and play a top tier card battler. And of course, at first you're going to say, I'm going to do one more run before I go to sleep, or just 20 more minutes. <laughs> I got some bad news for you, Sunshine. You're not going to be free from it until you reach Ascension level 15 or Covenant level 25. The good news is that this only happens with top tier card battlers, and there are precious few of those. And today, I'm here to talk to you about one of them. Because unlike people who spend hundreds of millions of dollars on the shit they do, and are therefore obligated to give their paying costumers what they want, if only to make their money back, I ain't monetizing shit. And that gives me the absolute freedom to make videos about a genre that I know you don't give two shits about. Why? Because I... Because I like it. it, it's fun. And completely ignore in the process that you're eagerly awaiting the Knights of the Old Republic review. Speaking of which... He's coming. He said it, he said he's coming now. But enough of that. Welcome to You All Entertainment and welcome to another episode of You All Gamer Recommend. And today, today we have the top tier card battler that no one has ever heard about. And yes, this game is up there with Slay the Spire and Monster Train. And in some respects, it's better. Yup, and I will die on that hill in the comment section if need be. Now you could make the case that Slay the Spire and Monster Train are both perfect 10 out of 10 games if you measure them with the tape of games that nail what they were seeking to accomplish. But Etheresa isn't a 10 out of 10 game because it fucks up a couple of things things that we are going to be addressing later on, make no mistake about it, but it makes up for these slip-ups a hundredfold by totally nailing some of the key aspects of the core card battler experience, and by taking some of those aspects to the next level. So let's get to it. Beneath Aresa features nine different playable characters that belong into three different factions. You have the Tainted Ones, House of Agatha the Ferradi, and the Guild of Ruinfarers. Each of these factions have mechanics that are specific to them. The Tainted Ones, for example, have the Cobalt Curse mechanic. They have a virus meter that's equal to the number of virus cards in your deck. And you gain a special card when you reach levels 5, 10, and 15 for the first time in every encounter. Now, these virus cards can be used in several different ways to fuel your strategy, and each member of the Tainted Ones has his or her own way to make the most out of these viruses. And one thing that I love about this is that each member of the Tainted Ones operate in a completely different way, even if all of their overall strategies gravitate around the use of virus cards. One of the big reasons why Slay the Spire has been so successful for such a long time is the fact that its characters follow completely different philosophies, employ completely different tactics, use completely different synergies, and even the way in which you play each character during the combat encounter per se is completely different. And this is something that Beneath Aresa also nails. And the best part is that it does so without shamelessly copying Slay the Spire. You do have this card though. Well, yeah, moving on. In Slay the Spire, each character has a few character specific cards in its starter deck, but they all have four blocks and four strikes, and you want to get rid of those as soon as you get the chance. Well, your playable characters in Beneath Aresa all have different decks, and all of the cards are either faction specific or character specific. And depending on what you want to do with your character, you might want to keep some of those basic attack and defend cards. For example, the basic attack for the Guild of Ruinfarers is Straight Shot, which does 12 damage. Now, almost every other non starter attack card is better than Straight Shot, but the thing is that Straight Shot has two mutually exclusive enhancement paths. It can be enhanced so that it does more damage and also generates a bullet charge, or it can be upgraded so that it does more damage and gives you evasion. And with these enhancements, these cards might actually be better than non-starter attack cards, even when we factor in the enhancement possibilities of these non-starter attack cards. It all depends on what you seek to accomplish. Evasion, for example, means that your character moves to a faraway zone before making the shot, and there are several cards in Antiquorums, which are like relics in Slay the Spire, that give you an extra something every time you change zones. 
Blurred Silhouette, for example, gives you four extra armor every time you change sounds. So if you keep all your original straight shots and upgrade them so that they all have evasion, you can constantly generate armor every time you shoot an enemy. Also note that characters have faction-specific attack cards, but each character has one starter attack card that is specific to him or her, as a starter card at least. I think you RPG freaks might want to look at the factions in this game as classes and the playable characters as archetypes, because this is how they work essentially. But wait, there is more. After you choose your character, you then have to choose your companion. And this choice provides a whole new world of possibilities. Choosing a champion who belongs in the same faction as your main character usually strengthens your strategy if it heavily revolves around the faction's mechanics. But there are super powerful cross-faction synergies that can totally make up for not making the most out of your champion's faction-specific mechanics. For example, some of the Guild of Ruin Ferret cards have the Point Blank talent, which pushes enemies into a different zone. Some of those cards don't do much damage, but they cost zero energy to play. If you pair up Sohoma or Flynn, for example, with Isandre, note that she has Viper's Bite, which does 35 non-lethal damage every time the target changes zones. So there you have a plus 40 damage combo that only costs one energy and requires you to spend only one bullet. I also love that the game's idea of balance is not to give every character the exact same opportunities against every challenge. In Beneath Aresa, just as it happens in Slay the Spire, you have to fight one of three possible bosses at the end of every act. For the first act, for example, you can get the Horde, the Council, or the Twin Heralds. The Horde and the Council are a piece of cake for Sohoma, but they give Sora a lot of trouble. But Sohoma, on the other hand, struggles quite a bit when she gets the Twin Heralds while Sora can usually make short work of him without breaking a sweat. It's also super interesting that not every character is available as a companion to every other character. And there are two companions that aren't even eligible as main characters. And there are lore reasons for this, but we'll get into that later. And I very much appreciate that not everyone has the exact same options. Sora, for example, is the only character that has access to the 41DE combat bot as a companion and Nereide is the only one that has this character-specific companion. Now, your companions don't work as your support factions do in Monster Train. You still only get card rewards from your faction every time you win an encounter. So your companion is more like a tertiary form of character customization, but it makes a world of difference. As for the cards per se, they are pretty fucking awesome, let me tell you. This is where Beneath Aresa blows everyone else in the ballpark out of the water, including your favorite card battlers. Isandra's strength, for example, lies in juggling virus cards between the draw pile and the discard pile. She has Inner Peace, which costs zero energy to play, and makes her choose one card in the draw pile and discard it. And if it is a virus, she gains one onslaught. One with a flow is an artifact. Artifacts essentially work like power cards in Slay the Spire. So if one with a flow has already been played, whenever you use Inner Peace to draw a virus, you also draw an additional card and gain 5 block. But if you also have Graduate of Violence, you can grab that virus again and return it to your draw pile and gain 12 block in the process in addition to the card's skills. You can also combine one with a flow with Violent Chain, which is an attack card that has the skill to draw a card, and if it is a virus, you can gain 4 block. That way you'll be gaining 9 block with that little move, and that's before we even consider the upgrades. Speaking of upgrades, I love how this is done in Beneath Aresa. I still think the sacrifice system in Monster Train is king when it comes to upgrades, but this one is pretty cool too. Each card has not one, but two different ways in which it can be upgraded. And I like that upgrades are also very tactical. Like we said, if you play a character from the Guild of Ruinfarers and your tactics rely heavily on changing zones, then you want to upgrade your straight shots with evasion. But if your tactics rely on drawing cards and reducing the cost by one, then you want to go for the ammo upgrade because straight shots do more damage than any other starter attack card in the game but they also consume ammo. Also note that almost every card has a little something extra in addition to its vanilla function, and it's this little something extra what makes it a worthwhile inclusion in your deck. Burning Alteration, for example, gives you 8 block and a permanent bonus of 3 attack. Pretty freaking powerful all by itself. But also, if you discard it with another card's effect, you draw a card. And this same logic applies to Antiquorums, which work like relics in Slay the Spire, and most of them have tactical value. 
they are rarely flat increments of this or that stat. They usually follow a, when such and such conditions are met, then such and such happens. You also have injectors in this game, which you can collect as a card reward after some combat encounters or as an optional reward when you hit a rest area. These are consumable cards that you can use only once per run, and some of them can be pretty OP. But naturally, if you don't use them, if you save them for a boss battle or for a particularly nasty elite, they are going to sit around in your deck just taking up space. So can you afford that luxury? Well, that's up to you. You also have stun cards, which work like curses in Slay the Spire, but in Slay the Spire you usually get curse cards from some particularly nasty monsters, or as a consequence of gambling on a random event that could potentially be very beneficial. But in Beneath Aresa these cards can be avoided, because they are usually presented as part of a heavy cost that you have to pay for an optional perk. As for the bad guys, Beneath Aresa is not in the same league as Slay the Spire when it comes to its enemies. Slay the Spire had enemies that messed around with the energy cost of your cards, some of them changed their minds about what they were going to do to you every time they got hit, some of them had to be killed all at once because they regenerated after one turn, some of them had spikes, some of them had barriers, some of them healed and shielded each other, and I'm only scratching the surface here. Boss battles in Beneath Aresa are somewhat comparable. They are puzzly in nature, and every character has to follow a different approach to crack the puzzle. But regular enemies and elites aren't as interesting as they are in Slay the Spire. The game makes up for its lack of enemies, however, by mixing up bad guys in combat encounters and throwing in unexpected reinforcements in some battles to keep you on your toes. And no self-respecting card battler with an aspiration of being labeled top tier would be complete without some form of progressive challenge system. Every run should be an invitation to try again under more difficult circumstances, and it should ideally get to the point in which challenges are insanely unfair towards a player. Slay the Spire has Ascension levels, Monster Train has Covenant levels, and Beneath Aresa has the Architect's Curse. And trust me, this game isn't fucking around with its difficulty. I acquired Beneath Aresa several months before Marvel Midnight Suns, and I bid for Axis's title in less than 10 days in the hardest difficulty level, and then went on to play Game Plus out of curiosity and dropped it after cruising through the first few fights. But while I have played Beneath Aresa a heck of a lot more, I'm struggling with the sixth curse level in this game as I record this video. The game also features an interesting system of rewards. It's simple but effective, and of course, like every game worth its salt in the ballpark, there's opportunity cost at play here with your options. You can't have everything, but you need to be clever about it. For example, here you have to choose between upgrading your companion or upgrading one of three randomly selected cards, and this means that there's a good chance you won't be getting the card that you want to upgrade the most, so it's probably better to upgrade your companion. However, sometimes you'll get to choose between six cards or from any card in your deck. My personal criteria is to always go for the Antiquariums whenever possible, because like Relics in Slay the Spire, these are permanent non-card upgrades that are harder to come by. This policy is also especially good if you have Sohoma as a companion, because she has skills that offer bonuses that multiply by the number of Antiquariums you own. There is however one tiny complaint that I have in this regard, and it's that sometimes you have to choose between restoring 10 HP or restoring 40 HP and losing 10 maximum health. But if you have aced the game up until that point and you don't need any health restored, the game effectively punishes you for playing well. In Slay the Spire you can rest and regain health at a resting area, but if you don't need to, there are always other boons that you can go for. Beneath Aresa features a very linear map, and we'll get to that soon enough, but every three or four nodes you can choose between a regular encounter and an elite encounter. And before the encounter starts, you can usually choose between one of two penalties, if you are unlucky, or between a penalty and a reward on one hand, and no modifications on the other, which is an interesting twist to the formula. Speaking of twists to the formula, you unlock expeditions in Beneath Aresa, which are comparable to some extent to the initial boons that you get from the giant whale in Slay the Spire. But these are way more impactful than the whale boons in Slay the Spire. Some of them are wild, I tell you, along the lines of, you're gonna be a millionaire, but we're gonna cut off your balls. One of them, for example, has a consumable card that deals 200 damage to every enemy and costs zero energy to play. But every enemy gets one attack on every combat encounter. And of course, it takes up space in your deck. But if you get to the final encounter and you've still not used this card, 
there's an 80% chance you're going to win the game. Unless you get this motherfucker. On the other hand, some of them favor the player in a grossly unbalanced way. The Ambassador of Terios, for example, makes you discard all your starting cards and build your deck from scratch with the 15 cards of your choice out of a selection of 35. And on top of that, it gives you a fixed increment of 2 attack beyond floor 1. This expedition is essentially a dream come true for those who refuse to accept that randomness is an important part of the card battler experience and the fact that card battlers are about dynamic strategy building. But don't get too excited though, you pussies. This expedition is very rarely on the menu. Thankfully, the game always offers a balanced array of expeditions for you to choose. There are not all these mega extreme combos of insanely good benefits with insanely high costs. Some are for pussies, and those are the ones that I usually choose. Like, plus 10 maximum health points at the cost of minus 15 HP initially. Or, five extra armor for champion fights. Yeah, I'll take those, thank you very much. But the best twist in the formula has to be actually playing the game. It's not your typical drag the card with a pointy arrow and drop it on the bad guy or the good guy. Here you switch your targets with the A and D keys on your keyboard and then you click on the card you want to use. And this makes the game feel intense. You even have combo animations for successive attacks, which is pretty fucking dope. But that's just cosmetics. The real fun twist is the fact that you also have close and far combat and this opens up a world of possibilities. Some cards have different effects when they are used on enemies that are close or far, some cards can only be used on enemies that are close, and some can only be used on enemies that are far. Take this card for example that gives you plus 7 block, and then an additional 7 block per every enemy that's far. Or this one that does 9 damage to the target, which isn't much, but if you use it on an enemy that's far, it deals 10 damage to the enemies that are near you before you charge. Some cards have effects that trigger when you change zones or when your enemies change zones. Some even work like an overwatch of sorts. They do damage when the enemy walks into your zone. You can even have entire strategies that revolve around changing zones. And as simple as this feature is, it is what takes Beneath Aresa to a whole new level. It's the tactical depth that comes out of there being far and near combat zones what makes this game truly different. And of course, the fact that there are cards, enemy talents, permanent bonuses, and a slew of other things that revolve around this mechanic. As for the game's production values, I can appreciate eye-catching graphics and dopamine injections of well-produced sound effects and elaborate animations. But these things are usually at the bottom of my priorities when it comes to most games, especially card battlers. But I am thoroughly impressed with this aspect of the game in Beneath Aresa, especially coming from Broken Spear. Who the fuck are you? Yeah, who the fuck are you, Nancy Drew? Beneath Aresa features a very strong and very cohesive artistic vision that brings to life a surprisingly interesting concept lore-wise. And that's something that you definitely don't expect in a card battler. The game opens up with a clever little intro scene that paints the picture of a post-apocalyptic planet somewhere on the fringe of the galaxy. A city that used to house powerful deities that are no longer around and has now been reduced to an outpost of illegal trade and other shady dealings. And though the intro scene doesn't explicitly surmise a connection between the current state of the city and the fact that the gods are no longer around, I can see a lot of people having questions about what's going on. Why are the gods no longer around? Did they flee the city? And if so, why? Were they perhaps the first victims of What lies beneath Orissa? And I didn't have these types of questions in Slay the Spire or Monster Train, because these games didn't care to elaborate about what was going on and why, and as a consequence, I didn't care to know more about it either. But in addition to the game's animated prologue, there are bits of juicy lore pertaining to the different factions and individual characters that you can play as in Beneath Aresa. None of these bits is particularly well written, but with some spit and polish they could have worked nicely like pieces of a narrative puzzle for the player to piece together in successive runs. Like this other game that you're already tired of me mentioning. There's also a lot of juicy gossip in there. For example, did you know that Isandre and Flynn were a couple? <laughs> no way! Did you know that Doltar, the son of the Patriarch of the House of Agisa himself, hired a shady smuggler and pirate of ill repute named Sohoma to do his dirty work for him? No way! Huh, so much for lawfulness and virtue, huh? 
And it's a pity that they didn't dive deeper into this premise. Not that I would have wanted them to go in the opposite direction and go full Marvel Midnight Suns by flooding the game with unnecessary dialogue and story bits. But they could have approached it Dark Souls style, with a vague conversation with a cryptic NPC here, an eloquent mysterious item description there, and hopefully a more foolproof ending. And I think it's a pity because the game's production values would have certainly supported a more thorough exploration of the story and the characters, because the world building aspect of the game is fantastic. The different locations in which the game takes place truly nail the look, feel and tone of a dangerous underground world that has been left to rot and the bad guys look like they've been corrupted by some dark unfathomable evil. As for the playable characters, I think they all look fantastic. They are quirky, fun and interesting and I want to know more about them. So Homo, for example, gives off the vibe of a funny, confident, sly little scoundrel. She's supposed to be a shady and unruly smuggler and everything from her tattoos to the piercing on her mouth to the way she wears her hair to her very outfit totally make her look the part in my book. And I was impressed with the many facial expressions she shows all throughout the game. A card battler game I might add, from the playful wink she gives when you choose her as a companion to the hell yeah face she makes when you choose her as your main character to the oh shit I forgot face that she makes when you play Sly Ceasefire to the many faces she makes during the transition scenes plus yep, corsets and push-ups can work wonders friends let me tell you that. Developers everywhere, bring back the nice racks. In the animation department this game also punches well above its weight Every attack has its own animation and we're talking about elaborate animations in which the character charges towards the enemy, jumps and lands dealing a devastating blow, or pulls out a gun and shoots the bad guy in the face as the camera travels in into a close up. And when you play a melee guy or gal, if you play successive punch cards, they are animated as a combo. How motherfucking cool is that? And look at this poison bomb and its particle effect. Who the hell are you guys and where did you come from? You have no right to be this anonymous and this good at the same time. Both things can't be true, I just can't wrap my head around it. This fight for example takes place in a moving elevator and look at these dynamic shadows. Even transition screens have little animations of water leaks and contaminated ponds. You also get an animation every time your champion goes from one node of the map to the next. And they are all character specific. Look at Flynn's quirky hair animation as he runs from one location to the next and Sora's butt as she, well, always. Developers everywhere, bring back the nice butts. Also, this butt and this long ponytail, don't tell me the devs weren't thinking of synergies. <laughs> and what do you tell me about the boss battles and the way the bosses are introduced? In some respects, this game has better production values than Monster Train, and that one was published by Good Shepherd. So, well, boys and girls, it's almost time to wrap things up and you know what that means. This wouldn't be a you old entertainment video if I didn't tell you about the things that I didn't like about the game, some of which I have already hinted at over the course of the video. First, let's address what some would say is the elephant in the room, the most recurrent complaint in those negative reviews on Steam, or at least the most recurrent complaint that is worth addressing. The game is unbalanced and difficult. Look Listen, if your idea of balance is that every character and every build has to have the exact same opportunities against every enemy, then this may not be the game for you. As for it being difficult, well yeah it is. It's taken me weeks to get to a point in which I can consistently get to the final boss in any essential level beyond the fourth, but this is where the game is at its best. If this prospect doesn't appeal to you, you might want to try out Dragon Eclipse, Gordian Quest, there are a lot of easy card games out there, and some of them are awesome. Allow me to recommend Death Roads. That one's insanely fun and very beginner friendly. Now, this user had this to say on Steam. Blah, 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 blah. Make the experience very beginner on friendly. Well, you're not wrong. He's not wrong at all, and you should probably know that before you get into this one. But like I said, there is one recurrent complaint that is worth addressing. And I think it's embodied in this comment. Insanely bad clarity. You will read a card and have no idea what it does. For example, card will say gain three, this random symbol, but it won't show even in the tooltips what that symbol means. Well, you're not wrong. Most cards are pretty straightforward and some of these little symbols are easy to figure out. Some others though, 
aren't, admittedly. And there are conditions like improvised that aren't explained. If you go to the compiler's archive, you get a bit more of an explanation of what these cards do, but you don't have access to this database in-game. I mean, Darkest Dungeon 2 also does an atrocious job with its tooltips, but at least this glossary is readily available at all times. What about these 1 out of 3 combat bot cards? Uh, why would I choose this companion if I have no idea what the potential bonuses are? Also, some of the expeditions that you can choose from at the beginning of the game give you the options to choose antiquorums like Sentient Shield or Seal of Shena, with insane trade-offs like minus two maximum energy. What? 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 But they don't tell you what the hell these things do. And you would really need to be a gambling man and one of immense faith to go for these insane options. I for one would have much preferred to know what these damn things do. Second, the story and lore aspects of the game could have been explored a lot more without any of it getting in the way of the gameplay. Tainted Grail Conquest is a perfect example of how this could have been done. Yeah, I know some of you guys are tired of me mentioning this game, but I can't think of a better example when it comes to card battlers that tell the story. Third, there are a few bugs and glitches. If you choose an expedition that involves changing your starter deck with non-starter cards and then choose a reward to discard non-starter cards, you'll get an empty screen that you cannot exit in any way. This has only happened to me once though. The game has also crashed more than once since I've been playing it, but thankfully you always pick up from where you left when you come back. Fourth, some basic standard features of the genre seem to be missing here. For example, you can't skip card rewards. Yep, but this sounds worse than it actually is, because in this game there are many ways to get rid of many cards at once, and the game provides a few mechanisms to mitigate the consequences of having a bloated deck. But still, this feature is missing, make no mistake about it. This feature is mandatory in this genre. Also, there is no store and no currency mechanics. You do have the option of choosing between two or three rewards in every resting area, but it's not the same as planning your journey on a map in which some of the nodes are stores and in which money is a thing. Speaking of maps, the game does not have a map with different starting points, and you could say, well, neither does Monster Train. But I think this particular game could have benefited from a few random non-combat events like the ones you have in Slay the Spire, and maybe from planning your progress in the map according to what you have and what you need like you do in Darkest Dungeon 2 and Slay the Spire. However, I admit that while I missed this feature terribly at first, I eventually came to enjoy this little path for what it was, and there is still some strategy involved in your choice of nodes as few as they are. If you have Doltar as your companion, you are definitely going to want to choose the elite fights every time. And last but not least, card battlers are all about conquering milestones. They're all about breaking your own records and getting a little further every time. And I'm sorry, but any card battler worth its salt has to document the player's progress and achievements. Ideally, it should allow them to revisit all their achievements and records and even their trajectory all throughout the many months that they've spent with the game. You are married, remember? And every marriage worth its salt has to have a picture album. Where's mine, Beneath Aressa? When it comes to this, Monster Train is the absolute king. Look at this. These are your covenant levels, and here you can see how many cards you've discovered and used on a winning deck. You can see which combination of primary and secondary factions you used to beat each covenant level, and even the champions that you used in every case. You can check which cards you've used in winning decks and which cards you haven't yet, and you can see a full report on the factions you've used and the combinations with which you haven't beaten the game yet. You have access to every record you've established in every respect, no matter how insignificant, from the most damage done in a single blow, to the most damage blocked, to the most frostbite applied, etc. Slay the Spire is a little bit more discreet, but it still keeps the record of all your achievements and even your runs. Well, Beneath Aressa has none of this. Nothing. Oh, you want to try out every combination of heroes before you exhaust all ascension levels? Well, it's Excel time for you because the game doesn't give a shit about this. Maximum damage dealt, minimum runtime, maximum amount of block generated? Nope, the game doesn't give two shits about any of this. And what kind of marriage is that? In the grand scheme of things, however, this game is an absolute banger. 
and maybe it has a few more shortcomings than other card battlers that I've talked about here on the channel, but the things it does well, it does exceptionally well. And these things all happen to be at the very core of what I want for my roguelike card battler games. And that's why it gets a solid seal of approval. If you liked the video, give it a thumbs up. If you didn't, thank you for watching all the way up until now. If you like what you are seeing on this channel, please consider subscribing and clicking that notification bell to avoid the usual YouTube shenanigans. Come check us out on Discord if you don't mind all the boomer talk that goes on there. I personally love it and wouldn't change it for anything. And share the video if you thought it was cool. Bye everyone. If you're excused, you can go back to playing video games.